Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches highlights our most popular herb, basil. Keith Reed, the OSU Extension Horticulturalist for Payne County, has tips on summer cover crops. High school students from OSU's Camp Turf join us with garden safety tips. And Barbara Brown prepares a celery salad. Basil is another great herb to add to the garden and whether you have a dedicated herb garden or just a little extra space in your vegetable garden, it's a nice complement to those vegetables as well. Now as basil is an annual, it will die each year, but it's easy to reseed um, and sow directly into the garden each spring. The hard part is deciding on which basil to grow. Now there's a couple of different types you can try. We have a small leaf basil right here that's called a globe basil. And this is only gonna form a compact about 12 to 18 inch round bush. And you can see it's much different than our traditional basils that we might see. Um, this particular one is gonna be slow to set seeds, which is nice. If you're looking for another one, there's also called a boxwood basil that also stays compact. And because of their compact habit, these are a nice addition to any small garden. Um, also, they're great for containers or even add a nice ornamental border. There's another cultivar called cardinal basil. And while it, this one's not blooming, it's actually been cultivated to showcase those flowers of basil. In fact, sometimes people mistake this for a showy burgundy celosia because of the beautiful flowers that it produces throughout the season. And it too will maintain that sweet, intense flavor of our traditional basils. Here in front of us, we have a more traditional looking basil. This one's called a Amazel basil. There's also one called Dulce, which is a 2015 AAS winner. And you can go with more of a citrus flavored basil that, with lime and lemon basil, or perhaps try a cinnamon basil that has red stems and a pink flower to it. A couple of purple foliage basils that you might wanna try are called purple ruffles or round midnight. Now, regardless of which basil you choose, they really prefer a moderate pH of six to seven and a half, and they also like a rich, moist soil. With so many different basils to choose from, there's bound to be one that works for you and your palate. to give you an update on our how our straw bell garden is doing and believe it or not there are straw bells underneath all of these tomato vines that are growing but I think the proof is in the pudding about how well these tomato plants are doing. Now we planted these tomato plants earlier in the season so that they would be aired on April 15th when it's an appropriate time to plant tomato plants. But that means we had to plant them prior to April 15th. And in doing so, they in fact endured a couple of mild freezes, which kind of knocked them back a little bit. But again, you can see they've requ recovered quite nicely. Now, the plants that we put in here are two different varieties. We put in a Valentine and a Candyland variety. Both are indeterminate and small tomatoes. Now, I prefer to plant small cherry type, currant type, or grape type tomatoes in straw bell gardens because it elevates them and allows you for easier harvesting. Now, again, we're behind on our chores, as you can see, and we should have staked these a while back, but it is time to get them staked now at the very least. And so we're gonna use a method called stake and weave, which is often used on tomato plants. And in doing so, we're gonna first need to set some T-posts on either end of our straw bells. 
After setting your four T-posts, we've used four because again, we have two rows of tomatoes here, so we wanted to have two trellises. Um, we've then used some twine. You can use whatever string that's gonna hold up for you. And we've done two rows to allow those tomatoes to grow up. Now, ideally, we would have done this when the tomatoes were really small, so we wouldn't have to be fighting with such vines, but I'm pretty sure I'm probably not the only one behind on my garden chores with all of the spring rains that we've been having. And in fact, I wanted to mention the spring rains because I think that these tomatoes have done really well from what I've heard from some gardeners with their tomatoes in the garden soil because of the excellent drainage that the straw bells have provided. I know here at the, uh, the Botanic Garden, we've actually had to replant our okra and our squash a couple of times because of the mild temperatures and the excessive amount of rain. So again, the straw bells have helped with that excessive amount of rain by providing good drainage. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and stake these tomato vines up, and there's a couple of different ways you can use that. You can use kind of a, a twine uh, that's a flexible wire twine, or we've got this green uh, tape that is also really kind of ideal because it allows for a little flexibility and it won't tear up your plants too much when we do get those Oklahoma winds. Or if you're looking for something that you might have around the house, go with some good old fashioned pantyhose or some stockings and those work well again to tie up those vines. So we're gonna use this green tape um, to work on our vines here. Now I admit pruning this way and trellising at this point is a little late in the game and it's probably not the ideal situation to do it. Again, we would have wanted to do these when these plants are smaller and train them up onto the string. However, because of the weather, again, it's delayed our gardening that we've been able to get out here and do. So at this point, the reason why you want a trellis is because you want to allow for good airflow. So I've taken a fair amount of uh, plant material that we weren't able to trellis off of the the plant. You can see in some situations the stuff that was underneath covered up by the heavy layer of plant above it. It's yellow, it's turning black and that sort of stuff. And all of that can lead to diseases and problems with the whole plant. So we've sacrificed some of the fruit, some of the healthy vines to clean it up. We've got some of them trellised. We probably will go in here and thin it out just a little bit more. But to allow that good airflow taking the plant up off of the ground, off of where the moisture is hanging out, the humidity is, because again, all of that will lead to diseases. So eventually these plants will be taking off with the summer heat. Today we're here in Stillwater at our Daily Bread Food and Resource Center where we've been busy establishing a new vegetable garden. And uh, here in Stillwater, just like much of the state, we've been uh, overwhelmed with uh, record-breaking rainfall this year. And so uh, I know that many of you at home maybe have already given up on your summer gardens uh, just because they've, they've simply drowned or in, in many cases that you've, you've lost your crop to, to fungal diseases or, or wet rot or all other kinds of maladies. Uh, and if, that, if that's the case, if that applies to you, we want to show you something here in our garden that would be a good option for you as uh, we move throughout the summer so that you haven't completely lost a, a year of, uh, in your vegetable garden. So right here we have a, a brand new raised bed that we're trying to establish. And a uh, couple of things I want to point out about this raised bed. For one, the raised beds have, have made it entirely possible for us to go ahead and garden this season uh, because we're, we're, uh, we've got some elevation, so drainage uh, and, and drowning hasn't been much of an issue for us. Uh, if you can see here, I'm standing on a fresh bed of wood chips and then I have this this bed that's in, in pretty good shape. Uh, another thing I want to point out about this garden is, uh, is we are using uh, organic principles to maintain it. And so that means no synthetic herbicides uh, to go after public enemy number one. And that is of course uh, Bermuda grass. And so one of our goals this summer is to, is to help minimize, get rid of this Bermuda grass. So what we're doing here today is uh, establishing a summer cover crop. So we've gone in and uh, we've sown uh, cow peas, 
sun hemp, and buckwheat. And all three of these plants uh, have a lot of value as a cover crop. For one, they help shade out the Bermuda grass that I've already mentioned. Uh, secondly, they're very quick. Uh, you plant them, they come up easily, and, and then they, they add nutrients. In the case of uh, uh, cow peas and, and sun hemp, adding nitrogen to the soil because those are legume crops. The buckwheat's well known for, for mining phosphorus, for bringing phosphorus up out of the, the lower levels of the soil into the topsoil. Uh, and then of course as these plants come on and flower, then they're beneficial to our, our pollinators. So just an all around uh, uh, good practice for a summer garden. So if we look closer here, this, this little this little patch right here has actually been seeded about two and a half weeks now. And so if you take a close look, you can see we already have uh, close to 10 inches of growth on that. And uh, it's a little bit of a uh, mess here because it's so busy. But if I just show you, this is sun hemp right here. And this plant will get uh, uh, relatively tall. It's relatively slender. Um, and one of the things I love about sun hemp is it, it puts on a beautiful yellow flower. This is a, a cover crop that could be planted almost for its yellow flower alone, a lovely plant. So here's a close up of, of the buckwheat. Buckwheat is, uh, it's probably its most outstanding feature in the garden is it's an incredibly fast crop. It can go from seed to flowering plant in, in a little over, uh, or 30 days if the condition's right. So uh, uh, very nice little summer cover crop. And then cow peas, many of you know them simply as black eyed peas and there's hundreds of varieties out there. Uh, once again, in addition to being a legume, it provides a lot of biomass as it breaks down. We work it back into the soil. It adds, adds organic matter. And then uh, uh, of course it has a, a flower once again for the pollinators. But then it's also an, an edible crop. Uh, depending on what variety you've chosen. So uh, pretty excited about this, uh, this cover crop stand. Once again, this is, is just a little over two weeks old here. And you can see from all this biomass production that it's already shading the ground. So in addition to building the soil, uh, we hope that it's minimizing our Bermuda grass to give us a fighting chance uh, on that end of things. And then for those of you at home that uh, are are pretty discouraged about your summer garden, you can just rest assured knowing you're actually building and improving your soil so that you'll increase your chances for a successful harvest, whether it's this fall or again next spring. Now let's go over to another part of the garden where we can take a look at buckwheat that's been, at, been growing longer with our student intern, Alex Rodriguez. This, uh... This buckwheat here has been growing for about two months right now. Uh, and it should have a little more leaf mass on it, but uh, right now it's looking just a little spindly just due to the amount of water we have, uh, since buckwheat just doesn't do all that well in really moist soil. You can probably see like in Keith's garden where he's got a lot less water in it, uh, the leaf mass is much larger, unlike ours, which is, you know, the largest leaf we've been getting are about so big, you know. So not exactly the best to uh, cover it up, but that's just due to the water because generally this buckwheat would have those large leaves that would just completely shade out that crabgrass and have for like the nice soil that would be underneath with the phosphorus that uh, would come up since it's mining the phosphorus out of there. Uh, we also have buckwheat that's been growing for about 30 days over there and um, it flowered up pretty early but that's not completely terrible considering around noonish we'll have a lot of bees and uh, butterflies that will come by and uh, pollinate throughout our flower garden here. So all in all uh, cover crops are pretty good for covering out weeds, enriching the soil for future crops and bringing in those important pollinators.
Gardening is a great outdoor activity that can provide a lot of enjoyment and other benefits, such as creating a beautiful landscape, growing your own delicious food, um, getting exercise and getting your hands dirty, and also um, just relaxing and enjoying the beauty of nature. However, there's potential for accidents to occur, typically due to shortcuts, lack of skills or training, ignorance of risks, lack of planning, wrong place and wrong time, and sometimes just bad luck. To ensure your garden stays a place of enjoyment, keep these tips in mind. Be, Be safe, safe in the garden. garden! Safety starts before you even walk outside. Make sure to wear safety goggles, long sleeve shirts, long pants, sturdy shoes, and earplugs when working with power equipment or tools. Make sure to wear appropriate gloves to reduce risk for skin, irritants, contaminants, and cuts. Mosquitoes and ticks can carry a lot of diseases. To protect yourself from this, make sure to apply insect repellent that contains D. Wear long sleeve shirts and tuck your pants into your socks. Whenever you are going outside to work in the garden, you need to make sure you take the right precautions to protect you from the sun. You need to make sure you're wearing sunscreen with SPF higher than 15, and long sleeve clothing such as a long sleeve shirt, a wide brimmed hat, and sunglasses. The way you design your garden can influence the level of work and strain. For walkways, use materials that provide good traction, avoid loose gravel and uneven papers that may cause trips and falls. That's gonna leave a mark. Avoid the garden if it is icy or slippery. Be sure to use raised beds and containers to reduce the need to bend over while gardening. Keep your flower beds narrow so you don't have to stretch over your plants. Never eat a plant you're unfamiliar with, especially if you do not know how it is cared for. Choose a fruit tree grown on dwarf fruit stalks so you can harvest your fruit without the use of a ladder. Or train your plant as an espalier. To prevent weeding as often, you can use ground covers or mulch. Mulch will also help retain the moisture in the soil so you don't have to water as often. Tools are often needed in the garden, but it's important to have the right tool for the right task. Make sure your tools are working properly and the blades stay sharp. You should always use hoses on reels and keep them rolled up when they're not in use. Remember to keep the tools and chemicals properly stored and out of the reach of children, even if the label says biological, natural, or organic. Keep water and electricity away from each other. This includes never using electrical equipment in the rain. Whenever using a ladder, make sure it is firmly placed to the ground and to never climb to the very top of it. Also, make sure you place the ladder to where you're working in front of you to where you are not working to the side of you. Avoid using watering cans as these can be heavy, but if you must use them, make sure they're only filled up halfway. Always make sure to keep your tools turned over so that you don't step on them and hit them. It's even better if you can securely prop them up against something so that you don't have to bend over to retrieve them. Place pruners in a boat holster to prevent misplacement and so you don't have to bend over to pick them up. We have back turns. Speaking of backs, back problems can affect people of all ages and make gardening very difficult. To avoid injuring your back, try these simple steps. Avoid repetitive garden working. Repetitive garden working? Yes, repetitive garden working. <sighs> Take regular breaks in the shade and drink plenty of water. Don't lift heavy objects. Instead, try using a dolly or a wagon. Listen to your body and know your limits. Use long handle tools to prevent from overstretching. And, and that, that is General Back Care! Finally, because gardeners use sharp tools, dig in the soil, and handle spiny plants, they are prone to tetanus infections. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention suggests that all adults get a tetanus vaccination every 10 years. This, combined with other day-to-day -day safety tips, will help you reduce the risk in the garden so that hopefully you will only reap the rewards. My name is Andrew Lobb. Hi, I'm Ryan Sexton. My name is Cameron Wallencheck. I'm Kane Brown. Hi, my name is Joshua Hall. My name is Corey Montgomery. Ashland Kreitz. My name is Caden Reynolds. My name is Piper Goodson. My name is Carmen Fitzgerald. Alyssa West. My name is Destiny Waters. My name is Michaela Gillis. My name is Kaylee Alford. Hi, my name is Kyler Plum. I am Ashley Stockso. My name is Danny Gregg. Hi, my name is Quincy Turner. Hi, I'm Julia Baker.
most of the time when we think of salad, we think of lettuce and tomatoes. And to be honest, there's a very large part of the year when neither one of those are at their peak. So we need to look more at some other kinds of vegetables that you can use as salad. So today I'm doing a celery salad. Now I've got four cups of celery that I've washed up and sliced fairly thin, not excessively, but I did slice them on a bias. Notice I've put the leaves in here too. There's nothing wrong with them. They add a lot of flavor. There's no point in throwing them away. So just make sure that uh, you get it all cleaned up well, you get it dried well, because we want to put a, a dressing on here. And if you've got it still damp, then the dressing is not going to stick to this. It's just going to slide to the bottom of the bowl. So let's make that dressing. I've got a fourth of a cup of olive oil. And again, use the best olive oil you can get. And then to that, I'm going to add two teaspoons spoons of Dijon mustard. And it's going to act as the emulsifier here as well as uh, add a lot of flavor to it. So let's see how much of that I can actually get off the spoon. Uh, and then I've also got two tablespoons of normally would be fresh lemon juice. And uh, when I do the shows, I have to bring things from somewhere else, obviously. So this is actually pickle juice because I forgot the lemon juice. But some kind of an acid, you could use a vinegar. Uh, fresh lemons, if you're going to use lemon juice, those would be awesome. Teaspoon of celery seed to reinforce the flavor that you're getting from the celery itself. And then a fourth of a teaspoon of kosher salt. I'm just going to whisk these together and make a nice emulsion with it. Now the thing you want to do with a celery salad, because it's going to take longer for the flavors to be absorbed here than it would to, to just have them on the outside. So I want some of this flavor to actually go into the celery. So if you're doing this at home, this is a great salad to make up an hour or two hours ahead of time. If you're going to church and you're going to have it after that, make it before you go. Uh, you can make it in the morning before you uh, go to work. Uh, but it gives time for everything to blend together. So we're going to combine those together. And where'd I leave my handy spatula here? Uh, and we're just going to mix those together a little bit, just enough to get it coated. And then to give it a little bit more crunch, give it a little diff different kind of texture, I've got one sharp apple, uh, kind of a sharp tasting apple as opposed to a really sweet one. And the dressing that we've got in here with the acid there, the oil, this will coat that and uh, prevent it from turning brown. So you don't have to worry about that when you come back in a while. The celery seed makes it look really pretty, I think. And then the, the next thing we're going to add to this is about four ounces of cheese. And I've tried to cut it so that the pieces would be about the same size as the uh, apple pieces that we put in earlier. Use a cheese such as a fresh mozzarella or uh, even a regular mozzarella. You just don't want it grated. I'm actually using provolone in this one, sort of a semi-hard cheese of, of some version. You could use cheddar. Um, it, that, to me, would be more of a, a last resort. Uh, you could also do something if you wanted to kind of mix cultures, since this has got more of an Italian base. Uh, you could use something like Swiss uh, would also work, or Emmental. Uh, you just, the, the sky's the limit. This would normally sit for at least an hour for those flavors to get a chance to blend. I'm going to go ahead and serve it up this time. Just remember you're going to cover it, put it in the refrigerator, uh, and come back for it after at least an hour so it has time uh, for the flavors to come together and give you something that's tremendously different than a tomato and lettuce salad, but equally flavorful. Last thing we're going to do on this one, just to top it off, I've got some toasted walnuts, and we're going to sprinkle those over the top. And this is going to, again, give us a little bit different flavor. You could also, if you didn't have walnuts, if you had uh, hazelnuts or pecans, any one of those is going to work equally well. This is celery salad. I think if you try it, you're going to be really impressed. It's going to pull you away and give you a little bit different perspective on what a salad should be uh, at the dinner plate. For Oklahoma Gardening, this is Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead.
Next week, we savor savory rosemary. OSU Extension plant pathologist John Damacone joins Casey to discuss potential disease problems after our extreme summer rains. We visit a prairie garden in the middle of the windy city, and Barbara Brown cooks carrots with some of our rosemary. We hope you join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.